Welcome to the uh, Open Seminars uh, Plan the Planet series at the Architectural Association. Can you hear me uh, loud and clear? Yeah. <coughs> the seminar is uh, a intersection of interests that really uh, have uh, coalesced uh, starting with the conversation uh, that our students uh, here at school have initiated last year on uh, what they call uh, the emergency, the crisis. And uh, the um, series is also for us uh, a way through which uh, we could uh, uh, start uh, delineating a few of the elements towards uh, 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 extended understanding of the relationship between architecture and uh, the transformation of our planet. So uh, we are uh, today in uh, the third event uh, of uh, the series uh, of Planet the Planet. And uh, because we are in a seminar, I would really like to make a quick recapitulation of what has happened in the previous episode. What, we, what have we been studying? And uh, the uh, initial uh, step was uh, coinciding with the climate summit uh, of AA action and uh, architecture declares uh, and the uh, way through which uh, uh, the call for revision of uh, the curriculum was set out led around two or three hundred people uh, to gather uh, students from all over uh, Britain and even from abroad to gather and uh, call for a radical revision of the architectural curriculum to start thinking of uh, intersectionality, that is uh, trying to understand how we can never disentangle one uh, constituent, constituent uh, uh, topic from any other transformative condition, how to initiate new forms of uh, student and institutional politics uh, about uh, the environmental catastrophe that we are living in, and how to start thinking a decolonization of uh, education and architecture. And the last element was really how to uh, start imagining different forms of outreach, different forms of uh, connection and uh, interconnection. It was a series uh, of discussion that happened across uh, the spectrum. And the um, second uh, event that uh, we've uh, discussed last week, somehow picked up uh, on that and started thinking, what does it mean to imagine an architectural education amongst other form generating processes, among other intelligence, among other uh, relationships, and among other institutions. And this is where uh, we invited uh, uh, Lucia Pietro Giusti, uh, curator at the Serpentine, to imagine with us what it means to have a practice that is never condensable in one entity. What, what does it mean to be uh, in an upheaval? This evening, we start with a very uh, stupid question, of course. Can we control the planet? It's an obvious condition. No, of course not. Uh, how uh, could we even think of such a, an idea? But, the reason of this is really to catch up on this uh, notion of uh, the upheaval, of being uh, in a disquiet, uh, of being in a moment of uh, uncertainty and transition. The disquiet is, of course, on one side, because we have no idea what control means. We have no idea what uh, it means <coughs> and it entails to think of controlling anything. Of course, we control the planet because we are alive. And of course we control the planet because uh, life controls the planet. The planet is uh, alive. We are not Mars, we are not uh, Venus. Our planet has a very strange combination in, a, in its atmosphere of two components that notoriously, when you mix them, explode, methane and oxygen. And that's what is fascinating, you know, that their relationships are constantly renovated by life, 
constantly there's uh, uh, more and more oxygen produced by life, more and more methane produced by life and by, from the decomposition. So uh, obviously we can control the planet. We control it. Human life controls it. All the uh, myriad of species control it. But at the same time, we know very well that it's the planet itself is not an object. It's not something that is under our devices, under our controls. So the two combinations is really what uh, we thought we would like to address in the third session. And uh, it is a combination that is a step towards uh, thinking new forms of practices, new forms of uh, activation. And I would like to uh, start by playing a very old uh, TV footage, maybe and just give us a little bit of a tone of what is going on. doesn't seem to be working. No. So we skip. We'll have to uh, maybe just sorry about this. Obviously, it was working until two minutes ago. Okay, we skip it. It's not a big problem to skip Margaret Thatcher. Before we go ahead, can we check that the video is now operative on some other? Our energy system, okay. Uh, for example, China is building essentially. Okay. So we skip Margaret Thatcher. <coughs> In 1989, Margaret Thatcher is uh, addressing the United Nations uh, General Assembly. And the point that she puts forward is only one, and that is whether the international community can address the impeding environmental catastrophe. And she asserts uh, rather forcefully in her argument that uh, the usual ways of uh, diplomacy, those mm, ways that uh, will deal with uh, uh, the complete annihilation of uh, humankind uh, through uh, the thermonuclear war or regional warfare that can be avoided by the uh, Security Council are nothing confronted with the ecological destruction, with the unrepairable damaging of our atmosphere. The result of that speech, of course, is uh, the establishment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, is a direct outcome of the Cold War. 
at the end of the Cold War, we switch very swiftly into the regime that take that understanding, initial understanding, and make it more and more uh, precise, more and more precise. But the alert is there from the outset. The alert is there in the 80s. And this is where uh, the seminar somehow will try to uh, revert. What, what happened? Why did we not do anything? In spite of doing everything, in spite of uh, getting together, organizing international organizations, studying, getting the best minds, getting the best technology to study the Earth, what has happened? Why do we have to now, in 2019, 30 years after that speech, have young students be somehow rebellious about their education, saying that nothing is really properly studied, and uh, nothing uh, that we know so far is addressing the issue. Uh, so the question for us is really one of uh, understanding what is that planet, what is that control that we're describing? And it's a condition that reverts on many ways, again, on the work of uh, Jacqueline Turret, the looming figure in the entire se uh, series uh, here is uh, this discontented uh, woman, Jacqueline Turret. And most probably she uh, drew this little diagram. Uh, it's marked as uh, by Constantinos Doxiadis, but we're pretty sure that, uh, of course there's no evidence, but uh, we're pretty sure that it was a diagram by Turret. It's a very simple diagram. It's divided in two. And basically it tells us that the more we will know, the better we will act. On, on the top, you see the forces shaping human settlements, and they converge, and they coalesce in stability, and then they diverge, and they come back. And the present is that moment when there's multiple directions simultaneously, and we don't know really what's going on and what's happening. And you see beneath uh, an amazing little diagram that tells us 100% of knowledge on human settlements. And that the moment that you have 100% of knowledge, I don't know what that means, uh, there is stability. And then there's instability. It's not clear the relationship between the two in diagrams. It's not clear whether the instability leads to ignorance or whether ignorance leads to instability. But it's quite interesting that this is the diagram that opens uh, the uh, Opus Magnum of Doxiadis, the uh, Echistics book. Uh, it's a book somehow that lays out the foundation for a, an architecture that will somehow encompass uh, the entire globe. So 30 years after knowing that something is wrong, that there's an alert, we're still in that situation, either because we don't know much yet about it, and we ought to know more, or maybe the diagram is also not so functioning. And this is where uh, I think the entire notion of uh, controlling and planet really reverts, whether we think that we are in any condition, sit in a situation where we need to raise awareness, or we need to be knowledgeable about the planet, about the Earth, and then we will be able to act. And I think that the obvious situation that we are uh, facing today is uh, one where, on one side, the planet is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller in our travel uh, times, in our ways of uh, communication, you know, the relative dimensions of our planet uh, is decreasing. This is another beautiful diagram uh, inspired by Turret, but this one is by Mr. Fuller. Uh, that shows that uh, the planet is becoming smaller. It's becoming an object, uh, the globe. And at the same time, we have no clue about what it is. We have no idea of understanding how it is reacting back on us. <laughs> so there are three uh, inherent moments of uncertainty in uh, this question. The first one is we controlling. Uh, what does it mean to control? The second one is that we have no real understanding of the planet. We have no real understanding of what this condition 
is. And the third one is how the intrusion of this uh, knowledge event that, uh, of climate change is received, which creates even more uncertainty because everybody uh, seems to be receiving it in completely different ways. So we have three moments of complete different uncertainties uh, overlapping. And the overlap of these three uncertainties uh, of what is it to control, how does it really operate, what is the planet, what's the horizon uh, through which we are operating, and how we are gathered all here in order, for multiple reasons in order to address this uh, thing is also a very complicated, uncertain condition. And these are the three difficulties of modernism the three difficulties of the modern thought that architecture so much endorsed, that so much uh, uh, operated with, the idea that you can control, the idea that you can control an object and that you are separate from that object that you can control. But now we are in a condition of being coextensive with the object that we control. And it's not obvious what is the agency. It's not obvious uh, what uh, the capacity of action and when, where the organization of action uh, actually occurs, whether it's in the object, in the milieu, or in the actants. And there's a specific uh, condition in all of this that is uh, related to, of course, the impetus of measurement, the impetus that architecture and engineering has always of the measurement, the uh, laying out and surveying knowing more in order to act better. And you can go from uh, initial surveys uh, like um, Burlaug uh, and uh, the initial beginning of the uh, Green Revolution or the entire reorganization of uh, Earth system sciences. Uh, what does it mean to study uh, geology? What does it mean to study the history of the planet? Does it, what does it mean to move away from a, a government organized largely around that knowledge? Uh, the large. Um, uh, parliamentarian structures of the supply chain of uh, the 20th century? Or what does it mean to imagine a world that is really organized around the civic enthusiasm for new development? So you start uh, new ways of gathering, new polities uh, to form. What does it mean to imagine that the decolonization process leads to gigantic infrastructures like the Volta Dam in Ghana? Uh, or leads to the reorganization of large swathes of agriculture, like in this image of, in Uruguay, uh, showing the uh, rapid advancement of new forms of uh, agricultural production. And at the same time, there's an uncertainty. You are pushed to uh, develop something and the new enthusiasm, but at the same time, you are uncertain. Yeah. There's obviously Rachel Carson's calls for the stop of uh, using DDT that initiates the entire environmental movement, that initiates the uh, international outreach about you know, calming down. Maybe that's not a, such a good idea, uh, all of this uh, rapid development. And yet, uh, at the same time, we start seeing the incredible rise of other forms of calculation. And, uh, measurement, uh, other forms of management, like the international uh, weather forecast that rises at the same time, and the trans from radical transformation of how we work, uh, the transformation of management systems, for instance, this is a meeting of the IBM uh, committee on how to address management structures in uh, Southeast Asia. And all of these uh, are conditions that are cutting across society, but uh, the transitions uh, are really uh, still dominated by large you know, enthusiasm. And today, we don't really know what's going on. Now, this is Indira Gandhi with uh, uh, President Johnson discussing the uh, possibility uh, of diverting uh, large uh, international funds to uh, development. Today, the same uh, funds are about trying to find out how to diminish the conditions of uh, depletion of our agricultural system. So you start seeing that at the same time, there's a rise of learning, of knowing, and a puzzlement. We don't really know what is it that we're looking at. And the more we learn, the more we do. 
and the more we transform. And all of this, of course, in the wake of the blue marble image. This is an image of um, the Earth seen in its entirety. It's probably the very first photograph of our uh, planet. The orientation is the original one with the South Antarctic on top, taken by Apollo 17. So the image represents the Earth system. In a system, different elements or components interact and are interdependent, forming a coherent whole sustained in space and over time with clear boundaries and durations of its internal and external relations. <coughs> Earth system sciences set out to understand the complex interrelations that characterize the Earth as a whole. They integrate a variety of disciplines and fields of knowledge production. The development of Earth system sciences has shown that the Earth operates as a complex single system with physical, chemical, biological, and human components each one interacting with all the others. They contribute to, a sh to, sh to shape a system that is self-regulating and presents multi-scale temporal and spatial coherences. The relational dynamics that characterize the Earth system are unique and are dominated by life. The conditions to maintain life are the result of complex self-organizing relations between all the components of the Earth system. The interactions between living forms and their inorganic environments affect the atmosphere, global temperature, ocean salinity, oxygen in the air, the water cycles, and the carbon and nitrogen cycles, all of which guarantee sustainment of life on our planet. The development of Earth system sciences over the last decades has indicated that human activity is deeply affecting the entire system. The atmosphere, the geosphere, the cryosphere, the biosphere, and the hydrosphere are faced with new forces, mobilizing the Earth towards instability and possibly great fluctuations in its in interdependent dynamics. So what we thought was uh, a closed world of escalatory uh, politics that will somehow create the uh, conditions through which game theory and computational uh, structures of, in the Cold War uh, would lead us to an, a better understanding of completely internalized, completely mathematized uh, world is somehow eluding us. The Earth system, which is uh, the technical lingo for Gaia, if you're not really uh, brave enough to discuss Gaia, you would call it Earth system. The coupling of all the physical components, uh, physical processes and dynamics, uh, one on top of the other that forms the whole, Gaia. At the moment that we discover Gaia, and we discover it in a very complex set of uh, procedures, we also discover that it's troubled, that something is wrong. So you start seeing that there's a, uh, this is the first uncertainty. Huh? The first element of the uncertainty in controlling the planet is that you don't know what you're trying to articulate. And the um, image here represents, of course, the uh, scenarios, the seven scenarios, the main scenarios of the IPCC report in 2004. Huh? It means Basically, you have around 30 scenario, uh, different models that are trying to uh, articulate what the Earth system dynamics are doing, and then you break it down, you calculate it down to seven scenarios. If it's, and you see that beyond 20, at 2100, uh, that is uh, in 80 years from now, the Earth could be anywhere in between one degree warmer and almost six degree warm and everything in between and that is the situation and just to remind us that the one degree warmer it's already warmer than everything that we've experienced in the Holocene so you start seeing that at the same time as we discover the earth the planet we are discovering the Anthropocene we are discovering the 
deep unstable condition of our planet. And this is a phenomenon that is somehow not only an intrusion uh, into what we thought was our science, uh, the most compli complex uh, science with multiple different differential equations m coupled and uh, attached one to the other. But what is really uh, interesting is that suddenly we discover the Holocene. We discover that the uh, conditions of inhabitation, the conditions that have allowed Gaia to be stable for 11,000 years are now completely offset, completely offset. And the most important one uh, of the uh, steps uh, towards this understanding is uh, the healing uh, curve. Uh, when Professor Healing and this is the first time that is really published as a complete series, and discovers the coupling of the breathing of the ocean atmosphere with uh, the uh, relationship in relationship to CO2 concentration. In the northern hemisphere, the, uh, in the summer, you have much less CO2 uh, than in the winter because of uh, the uh, flourishing of vegetation. And that is picked up by sensors on Mauna Loa, on top of uh, the Volcano Mountains uh, in uh, Hawaii. And that relationship, you start seeing the breathe in, breathe out of the planet, but it becomes higher and higher every year, almost in a linear fashion, with a little bit of uh, decline, a little bit of acceleration now and then, and when we uh, started measuring uh, it, no, the medium uh, parts per million of CO2 were around 312. No? Today we have the measurement every morning in our news. No? Every morning in our weather forecast, we know how much part per million of CO2 are in our atmosphere. So something really peculiar has happened in this last 50 years. Simultaneously, we learn more and more and less and less. The first models of the uh, Earth system are very basic models. You know, they are models that, uh, are, first of all, uh, represented in some of the first videos, uh, say, computer-generated imagery. You know, and uh, many of us spend days and days in front of uh, screens. This is the very first uh, operation of such a, a kind uh, developed by uh, Chuck Leith. Uh, and Chuck Leith uh, was really interested in understanding how to use supercomputers uh, that were established and invented during the Cold War for uh, understanding nuclear explosion. And with the help of uh, Ed Teller at uh, the uh, Livermore uh, labs and uh, pushed also by John von Neumann, uh, understood that maybe not so many people are interested in, in the dynamics of a, a nuclear explosion, but everybody's interested in knowing the weather tomorrow. And so we could divert an entire uh, industry of computation directly from thermonuclear uh, dynamics into the study of the Earth system. And today, that is... is um, from a 
project that we started in 2012-13, which is called the Anthropocene Observatory. And it was a research into what the beginning of, of then beginning of the Anthropocene terminology. And we were collaborating with the photographer Armin Linke and Anton Franke in Berlin. And it was exhibited in four episodes at the House of All Cultures. of the roof of the Center for Climate Calculus in Hamburg. Uh, the incredible uh, condition that everybody understands having a personal computer is that uh, personal computers uh, uh, produce uh, an, an incredible, I would say, transformation of energy. Believe me or not, by that time, the global climate models, global circulation models, still were based on uh, mathematical description of two segments of the Earth system, which is the ocean and the atmosphere. And the land was simply a one, we call it green slime with one vegetation doing nothing. So up to 1990, the global climate modeling community believed and were convinced that we can understand the functioning of the Earth system, climate system, by coupling ocean and the atmosphere. So we entered uh, as a community of land-based, land-interested scientists to debate in 1990. It was a very exciting time because it was a new venture for all of us coming from the fields of hydrology and land-based hydrology. And uh, started to have a both theoretical and practical uh, collaboration. Theoretical built new models which will make clear that uh, land component, land use, land cover in the Earth system is very important for understanding, modeling of the global climate, global circulation models. But also going for a, uh, in my career, the most interesting venture ever, which was to design a series of a large scale experiments around the world to understand how the uh, biota, how the land interacts with climate. We started uh, with an experiment which uh, were based on a uh, so-called uh, multi-scale approach to measure everything you can measure in a grid of 100 by 100 kilometers from the scale of a uh, soil column leaf all the way up to satellites in the aircraft. We built an international community between European and American scientists to do it. And we went to a couple of regions around the world to measure the interactions between land uh, land cover, land use, land vegetation, and the climate. We went to Sahel, we went to south of uh, Spain, we went to Amazon, we went to boreal forest in Canada. And if I say we went there, we went there with a uh, huge armada of instruments, aircrafts, helicopters, satellites, 300 scientists. And doing that, we realized that uh, it's not only measuring the current functioning of the land in the climate. This is uh, Pavel Kabat, director of the uh, YASA Institute, the uh, uh, International uh, Advanced System Analysis Institute in Luxembourg. He is sitting on a beautiful sofa in the office of the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the castle is also the site of uh, the first international organizations uh, that um, somehow think of the transition out of the Cold War, out of uh, the uh, duality of uh, the scientific approach to the possibility of uh, annihilation. Let's listen to uh, the second in command, Nebosia Nakicenovic. Our energy system, okay? Uh, for example, China is building essentially one car coal power plant six, seven days. Um, those coal, uh, coal power plants will be around for many decades. Once you build it, unless you want to junk it, and we know some examples, for example, in nuclear energy, we will be junking some power plants, so it can happen, but we cannot junk everything. And so once these power plants are built, they might be around 50, 60 years, 
the notion is a, a, of a lock-in. That's the notion. We are locking in ourselves into a particular future, whether we like it or not. By making those smaller cumulative decisions, we lock ourselves in, thereby decreasing the degrees of freedom of taking an alternative path, which might be renewable energy or something else. And so I think this is a very good example. So in this case, it would have serious consequences for the climate. And it's similar in the other areas so, of, you know, and climate is an important part of the Anthropocene. So I think this is, this is really the nature of the dilemma, that we don't have the time to waste, even though it's a long-term problem. And that, I think, it's very difficult to internalize, that the decisions that we have been actually making over the last 20 years are locking us ever more into, into a development pathway that is not consistent with the notion of Anthropocene. So you have simultaneously a discussion about inertia, about the impossibility of action, lock-in condition, hysteresis of society, and mobilization of the planet. And this is the inversion uh, of the title of the series, Plan the Planet. What is happening in this condition is that you're, mo you're seeing the movement reestablished away from the fixed object of the blue marble, the dream of uh, the second part of the 20th century that the Earth will be something completely controllable. Suddenly, the agency is no longer in society. We are in a lock-in condition. We are talking about tipping points of glaciers and ocean circulation and uh, our organization of the uh, earth as extremely complex dynamic condition and the difficult part is that the only way we can know of this is through the complex making of the models through the complex making of those mathematical models This is a, a COP meeting in Warsaw. Human influence on the climate system is clear. Human systems and societies have forms that develop over history. The specific human relations are shaped, structured, and hardened by these historical processes. Individuals, groups, and societies are shaped in their interactions by these processes as much as they contribute to their dynamics. Long-term inhabitation of cities, lands, and territories, intricate networks of communication, long-term development of everyday life forms and rituals, all play a major role in human history as much as local contingencies and immediate actions do. The intertwined relation between the history of nations and the history of the earth has been at the center of many different conceptualizations and civilizations over time. The development of these <coughs> concepts, their specific history, their formalization, structuring, and diffusion is equally a key element in the formation of world systems. World systems are a coherent sweeping force unfolding across large areas and through economic, social, political, and cultural structures and interactions. They operate at very high levels of coherence and unfold at scales well beyond the individual elements that shape them. They are whole. The boundaries they structure and the flows of energy, money, ideas, language, social class and rank, law, population, power, all of which characterize each world system in its particular development, <coughs> shape complete systems which operate as complex entities. The social construction of time and space evolves through rapid transformations. It is a succession of different dynamics where different forms of documentation and different practices of power affect the overall system. World systems develop through tipping points through transitions that bring the system from one level of complexity and coherence to another. This is a complex process of construction and destruction, which leaves stratifications in language, social relations, ideas, and rituals. It also leaves material forms in its wake. The intricate geometries of cities, monuments, 
fields and infrastructures, all of which sustain a specific form of a world system and which are carried over from one world system to a new one. Monuments, documents, technologies are the material inscriptions of world systems. To decipher them, humans need to conceptualize their own history in relation to the history of the planet. Today, to decipher what a world system is and its extent, its uh, cohesion, uh, its uh, coherence, the meter is becoming larger and larger. What we thought would be uh, in human uh, reach is now only understandable through the complex technologies of remote sensing, through the complex technologies of the double gaze of uh, the uh, view from above, almost like a, uh, the godly uh, view, and from within. And this duality uh, accentuates again the uncertainty of our condition. We never have a vantage point. Uh, on one side, these are technologies that re-establish and reinforce in us the idea that there is an object to look at from the outside, from satellites, through the gridded view of the multiple scanners that are orbiting uh, the satellite. On the other side, we know very well that there's no such thing as the globe. There's no such thing as a unique vantage point. There are multiple localized formation of the global, multiple localized condition where the globe is invented, articulated, manipulated, calculated, uh, measured, surveyed, and re-established. So what you uh, start seeing is not that the intrusion of Gaia is somehow revisiting our foundations of society, foundations of the world system to make it more and more in tune with uh, this new entity that is uh, Gaia, but on the contrary, it is so inherently unstable that it reinforces our image that the Earth is an object and dismantles it simultaneously. And this is the puzzling condition of architecture where the making of uh, the knowledge of climate change is like a whirlwind that brings us constantly, simultaneously, in a condition of being, viewing from above and from within. It's a dual duality that it seems uh, to us that we are unable to escape, unable to uh, get out of. Uh, the only capacity uh, is to understand, in, the only capacity to understand the troubled earth is through the industrial gaze that has troubled it. And this is the real difficulty, <coughs> because on many levels we start thinking that we ought to be somehow in tune with nature, that we ought to be somehow more and more addressing a condition of somehow pacification of our activities. Somehow we should act more properly. But the trouble in that uh, assumption is that you are in a Holocene set of ideas where nature is a stable background. It's the backdrop of our activities and the more in tune we will be with them, the more we will have somehow peace. Today, that ground through which we should somehow reorganize is equally unstable. It's equally uh, plowed through, mobilized, transformed, and Michel Serre would, would have said, it is moved. The condition through which we can sound, we can measure uh, the Earth has augmented enormously in the last 30 years. They have become the way through which we operate ecologically. It's an industrial gaze that allows more and more extraction. The more and more we know, the worse it gets. And that diagram of Jacqueline Turret somehow resonates in completely different uh, terms. Today, what we are seeing is that the rise of the Anthropocene, the new geological epoch, is cutting across territories. It's cutting across established forms of life, not only human life, but the multiple species, the multiple conditions uh, that operate on the uh, surface of our planet, on that very thin layer. 
The Anthropocene is the new geological epoch where the world system dominates and impacts the Earth system at new and unprecedented scales and intensities. It sets in motion a series of reverberations and oscillations that scatter long-established boundaries, and it opens up a new set of divisions of time and space. Territories are the specific forms of the links between the Earth and human beings, between the Earth system and the many world systems that humans shape. Territories are the sustained form of relationship between human cohabitation and material processes, unfolding in time and across space. They are a construction developing over time, and they mold the structures of environmental processes as well as specific forms of human polities. The boundaries of the social, economic, the legal, political, and cultural spaces that territories shape, their rules of legitimation, inclusion, and exclusion, their members, their hierarchies, their cohesion over time and space are all reflected and marked into the forms of terrains, river basins, shorelines, fields, the modes of organization of work on the land, the shape of settlements, and the framing of circulations of goods, people, services, ideas, and capital. Territories evolve in time and in space. They are dynamic system, shaped by a vast array of individual interactions, local contingencies, and specific sets of agents. The particular forms of these interactions and their relative stability over time shapes vast systems of coherence and power. They shape the relations among humans and between us and natural resources and processes. The rise of territories, their development, articulation and organization divides time and establishes boundaries and borders in space. These divisions are as dynamic as their counterparts. For the rise of new territories cuts across established relations that forming new articulations in their wake disrupt and severe previous ones. The conceptualization of these moments of transition, the relations to the material traces and the human histories of these transformations is what guides and forms aspirations of knowledge, governance, and influence over human spaces and earth processes. The Anthropocene is reshaping these aspirations, reallocating and redistributing agencies establishing new power relations and new links between atmospheric chemistry and human political action, between ocean circulations and infrastructures, between sedimentation processes and engineering, between extraction of energy and natural resources and the forms of globalized economy and war. The aspiration of buon governo, of good government, is what guides the revision of our practices, the call to change how we govern our architectural education, how we study. It's exactly what is at the same root as the formation of the Anthropocene. The architectural masterpiece of all of this is the, stru uh, the structures of refineries. The link between supply and demand of fossil fuels. The refineries, uh, in a nutshell, the architecture of the Anthropocene. It transforms fossils from millions of years ago, the biosphere that used to inhabit this planet, and has disappeared from the Earth system. The Earth system has survived, but those species have not. And we are rapidly transforming them into food, into livelihood, into movement, into cities. And all of that process has an enormous waste, an enormous level of rubble and uh, that is not recirculated. So once we extract that through our complex contemporary world system, you know, we start seeing the intrusion uh, into the Earth system. And we'd like to uh, somehow wind up the seminar this evening by uh, alluding to a s another element that I think is uh, equally 
unsettling. Not only we don't know what control is, and we are uncertain by it, there's a second level that we mentioned that what is the Earth. We're getting more and more uh, knowledge about it, but we know less and less about it. And the third level is how do we react to this? What are the conditions that gather us around this, which is an aesthetic condition? It really pertains uh, how we can gather around what we can perceive and how we are affected by it, and we can somehow react to it. But there's an equally troubling condition that is that the distinction between us, we, and the planet is becoming weaker and weaker. On many levels, the Anthropocene could be seen as nature becoming more and more human, or humans becoming more and more nature. And the undistinguishability, to use a horrible word, the fact that we cannot separate human activity, the, the social activity from its material compounds is really the difficult moment of uh, the contemporary condition of whether we can control the planet. So these are the, a few remarks. And of course, this is a seminar. So everybody is here to work and participate. And we do this in a convivial way. And our friends have now just brought in some nice drinks. But come to the table and share the drinks and bread and grapes wow. and continue the discussion. Don't be shy. The microphone is going to circulate for your questions, because we are recording this for those who are uh, away. This is a mark of uh, a different world system. You know? The bread is cut rather than rather than shared. Please come. Do we have first questions? more about the your thoughts on the external and internal view because in 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 physics it's very important that you are internally into the system rather than seeing from the outside otherwise you never understand certain things about complex geometries or how the earth actually works in terms of its laws so can you give us a little bit more on, on that duality that you were talking about? Can you yeah. explain that a bit more? It's also in uh, social sciences, it's uh, a crucial moment, no? the implication. I think that on many levels, the you're always inside. There's no externality, uh, is really what we are uh, describing. We are, think of the relationship between the sciences and politics. On many levels, we still, I guess, envision sciences as operating within the lab, a confined space. And they will test things. And when they are ready in the test, they will bring it out for the public or for democracy, if you're lucky, mm -hmm. uh, to evaluate the test. What is interesting in uh, climate change, 
sciences, but climate is really only one of the components of the Anthropocene, you know, probably the minor one, is that that distinction doesn't exist. We are coexistent with the lab. So you are, there's only a possibility of being within. And that's why there's so much disquiet around the notion of facts, you know, because everybody is still calling for facts. There was uh, recently uh, a public debate on television where uh, basically the entire debate was shouting at each other whose facts are better than the others. Uh, uh, complete uh, return in this particular uh, country to conditions of uh, the beginning of uh, the scientific revolution. Uh, so we still think that scientific facts are on one side and political debate is on the other side. But what is really interesting is that if you are only within, there's no possibility of making that distinction. So the question is, either you start seeing that science is inherently political, and politics is equally inherently based on evidence, and hence you can no longer make that distinction, which brings, I think, more than simply a distinction, the usual distinction in, say, whether you can ever be somehow a neutral external observer. Uh, what is interesting for us is that what it really brings about is the notion of constant measurement. How many steps have you taken today? Did you check your supercomputer in your pocket that will tell you how many steps you took and whether your behavior follows a dynamic that is you know, somehow inscribing your daily movement in a good way. Now, you start seeing that the entire uh, operation of what we thought was science and society is now so merged that it really affects our daily behavior. You know? This thing is, I think, 10 times more powerful than the supercomputer that uh, uh, organized the first uh, complex coupled models of climate change. I think I use it mainly to take pictures of my little son. Mm. <laughs> and this is, I think, the in interesting thing. No? On one side, there is, I quickly showed you know, this question at the end, uh, how heavy it is all. No? This is the rise, we call it in lingo maybe, the rise of the technosphere. We built so much stuff that from within, and this is, again, the question inside and outside. We think it's only an issue of design. So we could design it better because we are architects. And look at how bad architecture they've done. If only they would have given us the job. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you understand that the magnitude of all of this is so vast that we are only one of the components. Actually, we are working for it rather than it working for us. And by it, I mean uh, the new paradigm of the Earth formed by everything that keeps us alive. So I think that the inversion is not a, uh, say, it's not the Galilean inversion, where suddenly we are no longer the center of the universe, we're just a little thing. But it's a very interesting uh, upside down view on us. We're not looking at the moon. Uh, our friend Bruno uh, Latour will say we are sublunar. No, we're not going to space. We are under. And suddenly you have to understand that what it means to be within, what it means to breathe, is troubling. It's deeply troubling and unquieting. And uh, we are not living in a stable planet circulating around the sun. The sun is getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And over our history of the planet, the planet has remained more or less the same. Just, just to add to that, I mean, the, in, in terms of the, if there are two viewpoints, or we accept that to a certain degree, I mean, one could say that in the past, you know, the two viewpoints two viewpoints were the gods and us, as it were, you know, they, they had a view from above, as it were, they could see things. I mean, it seems to me that it's interesting that um, it may be more possible to react to the internal politics and the external politics. And by that, I mean the two views. Mm -hmm. 
because, I mean, there are examples where the satellite view will, when looked in detail from the inside, will reveal something that the inside would never reveal. So that's the case. It's a duality of perception in a way. But it seems to me that the, the external view that we're seeing, and many of your images show, is they're that... They're all from within. Yes, but they're, they're the really tricky ones of how to create uh, an agency or a mechanism to try and deal with the issues as seen from um, that distance rather than from within. Is that, do you feel that's the case, that it's, it's, it, there's this <coughs> differentiation between where we can act or not act, or are they so interconnected that it doesn't matter? First of all, it depends really what you mean by action. I really think that the major question, and this is for us the major question on why we bring up uh, the entire notion of control and uh, you know, territory, is in order to somehow make an inversion of where action lies. And action for us is a territorial condition. No, we are territorial agencies, not that we are an office of the territory. No, we are, are interested in territorial agencies. Or we're interested in understanding how the demarcation of what keeps us alive can act back on structures. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you start seeing the sustained forms of coherence of inhabitation across time, and then try to figure out how to modify it, it's almost impossible to do that in our mind without reverting to either a notion of you know, individuals pushing a little bit here and there the system or systemic change, but a system is in both. You know, you're thinking in both cases about a very complex behavior, a very complex uh, mass and a very complex set of dynamics. And they're all coupled, but they're not one. And that's the difficult part. You know? So I think that your question is really important in terms of what can you do when you're within? How can you act through digression? How do you uh, move away from that? I think that is uh, an important element. There's a little sub-note in your uh, question, if I could say so, and you still think that God is above. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's uh, really the troubling part of the Anthropocene. The troubling part of the Anthropocene is that it also implies a complete inversion of the deity and the, well, and the location of agency. So if we could use that, it's no longer possible to imagine outside. In it. So even that outside is troubled. You know, our uh, discussion with uh, bishops and uh, leaders of uh, different religious movements really indicates that they are as troubled as you can imagine about the inversion of secularity. You could imagine you know, that the entire secular movement as we knew it in the Enlightenment was all about me mechanic. You know, there's a law that is a mechanic law or mechanistic law that allows you n somehow to elude the condition of um, providence. And suddenly, you discover that Gaia is really secular because it is not mechanistic, because it is uh, organizing multiple feedback loops, multiple tipping points, multiple coupling. It is not that mechanistic viewpoint that allows us to think it as an object or as a machine. And this is really the troubling part. Uh, and we are as confused as we could be. And this is really fascinating. We are so confused. We have no idea what's going on. Just maybe to, to add to that, the terminologies like the Anthropocene hasn't been around for so long. It's just 19 years since it was first uttered by Paul Crutzen. And terminology such as technosphere is just like four, three, four years old. And equally, the um, earth system sciences are decades. Like, we are in this new situ situation, but we haven't been there so long. Um, <clears throat> so there was something uh, I, I really I find very interesting, the idea of this duality, and I think uh, with what 
you've discussed and presented to us, I personally feel much more aware of certain terms and nuances and how, in fact, uh, advocating at this scale of thought is uh, of crucial importance. Um, I, I agree with how I, I really like how you started saying that we were wrong. There is something wrong around us. And in fact, when something is wrong, we perhaps one way of dealing with it would be to backtrack and, and see uh, what we've done wrong and perhaps start from somewhere that is uh, a good starting point again. Um, but at the same time, I wouldn't uh, want to you know, question and throw everything that we've done so far because the Anthropocene is not just uh, bad. But one of the wrong decisions we've done in the 19th or 20th century is definitely the way we've used um, air conditioning and heating and the way we've you know, created the built environment. Because we know today with how we measure things, as you mentioned, and <clears throat> we, we can sort of sort in, in a list of where it would be the most relevant to act or where should we cut down these sort of inefficiencies or, or loss of, uh, of uh, resources. And definitely one of the biggest uh, things that could concern us as architects are, is definitely the way we create spaces in which we live. And those are responsible. The way we build today is definitely responsible for nearly half of the global carbon emissions in this Gaia. So I think within that duality, you know, we're almost half from within. We have to deal with something that is so practical and something that we've there's nothing, you know, we've always, uh, there is bioclimatic architecture, there is, uh, there is adaptation to climate, there is um, vernacular architecture. Um, yeah, they're all interesting things, about, uh, particular vernacular architecture, I think, is an amazing uh, thing. What might be troubling in, if, in our uh, fascination with uh, the, you know, the native, in the vernacular, is the fact that there's not one single polity, not one in history that has had to organize their life because of the intrusion of the Anthropocene. So we might somehow be happy for a few minutes in thinking that uh, we go back to nature, we go back to how we've done it before, and suddenly we find their uh, solace. But I was writing down here a few notes of what you were saying, which is really interesting, you know, the air conditioning uh, and uh, going back to find the moment when we didn't do it so wrong. Uh, there's a technical description for that, going back. It's called the shifting baseline. And uh, this really comes from the work of, among others, uh, someone called Jeremy Jackson, a fantastic uh, uh, ecologist, and we are very happy to call him a friend. Uh, a shifting baseline, and uh, Marina knows about this, uh, is a condition where you imagine a pre-established condition that you want to somehow, you aspire to go back to. It's without understanding that that baseline had already declined in the functioning of uh, the Earth system. So what happens is that you end up having no, as you progress in the destruction, you go back to a pre-existing baseline that is in itself destroyed. So most of the time this happens in our image of nature. And it, for obvious reason, uh, our image of nature is formed when we are kids. So my image of nature is somehow less destroyed than your image of nature, but maybe by 20 years, and that's it. Mm? You have no image of nature those years before. Or better, you have an image that is a heavily constructed image through the articulation of uh, culture, of the world system. And this is the troubling element. That is one thing that I think uh, could be uh, interesting to look at about air conditioning. I personally like air conditioning uh, quite a lot, uh, in particular in cars. I, usually, the call is to make things smaller. 
Mm? Open the window rather than have air conditioning. I'm interested also in the other dimension, to make things bigger. No? If you look at termites, they have the relationship between their homes and, them and their body, even the societal body, is much larger than ours. We tend to make everything little. No? Imagine if we would be able really to make gigantic things and able, through air conditioning, to start thinking of a reduction of uh, energy consumption. I like air conditioning, but I don't like internal combustion. Two different things. No, I think that we, when we really get it wrong is when we burn things rather than when we uh, use the converted energy. No, I wanted to tell uh, when I, we were looking at Pavel Kabat about the uh, amazing thing of computers. No? Those ventilators are just there to cool down the supercomputer. So the supercomputer that is calculating climate change for the European Union is consuming as much as one town. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> but if you think about it, how much are you consuming in one, in one year? What is the town? No. And so the interesting element is exactly that the reaction is how one, oh, but how can it be? Uh, so they should consume less energy. But this is interesting. How to increase the efficiency of computing in order to uh, calculate somehow more and have more knowledge, remember the graph, is one where we've reached peak computational capacity. If you go and visit, uh, if you have the bad hobby like we have of talking to the modelers uh, and you end up having them constantly discussing when are they going to buy the new supercomputer. It's not that it's going to be more powerful, it's just going to consume less. So it's, you see, when uh, we're saying that you're within, it's even the knowledge about uh, that you're within. You, know, you have to imagine that the computing capacity is limited by energy consumption. I was I was a bit struck when when I realized in, in what I've seen tonight the the idea that in, it's true. Uh, we are trying. We are still in the Holocene. There's an approach that is. Uh, no, no, we are in the Anthropocene. Yeah, uh, sorry. Maybe in our minds. That uh, this uh, idea or this aspiration to adapt to a climate and consider it as a stable uh, uh, measure or uh, as a stable entity is wrong because it's evolving, it's being moved, and that at a pace that is uh, still un not understood uh, enough. Mm -hmm. But is, is, um, do we have that much time in order to, to be victim of such great change? I mean, within 50, 100 years, the IPCC is predicting some more drastic variations and more uh, uncontrollable. You know, the peaks will be higher, the average will be a bit higher, um, the, the cold will be colder, the hot will be hotter, and that's worse and worse. Which means that we have a sort of uh, adaptation opportunity. You know, we, instead of having anything fixed, we could see a future where we adapt and... Yeah. So if you are uh, a designer, I don't know you, but you know, then you need to articulate that adaptation uh, around uh, very clear baselines to go back. No, no, if you look at London, you could imagine that we're going to face, we are very close to the sea. We're going to face a uh, major disruption through the storm surge. And uh, maybe there's uh, even more and more heavy rain. I mean, this last month has been quite heavy. So the last report that came up came out two weeks ago, which is you know, in the circuit, is considered quite a conservative report, tells us you know, that the rate of sea level rise is almost double than we thought 10 years ago. So imagine 10 years ago, we might have been adapting. We were not. You know? and the last time that we started adapting was at the time of Thatcher. Uh, we gave up that. But if 10 years ago we would have been adapting, we would have been adapting at a rate that is now considered double. So we would not have been able. So you're in a situation where you know, the certitude of what you need to adapt to uh, is impossible. So it's a good talk to imagine, yeah, 
and we can plan. Uh, this is our baseline. We need to be there, we need to adapt, we need to organize society so that uh, we reallocate uh, 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 resources, uh, demand and supply should be uh, distributed in that way in space and time. But all of this at the moment of rapid transition. And this is the difficult part for architects because on, it's obvious that we have a major task at hand. In the next 30 years, we have to redesign everything if you listen carefully to the, uh, to the IPCC, but to redesign everything. But the only way through which we can design, you know very well, is through stability. This is the situation now, and I hope to have it like that in the future. And this is really the disquiet of uh, such a little question, can we control the planet? Obviously not. But the point is, how do we uh, operate within that? How do we start uh, making our way through and how do we do that also with making clear alert markers i think towards uh, the increase operations of what we call the empire of calculus that everything needs to be calculated everything needs to be measured uh, your heartbeat in relationship to how many minutes of uh, uh, screen you will looking at while texting your friends no everything is that sweeping condition of uh, calculation. I, th I find it extremely troubling. More questions? Hi. Um, thank you, Anne Sophie and John, again, for bringing us together in the most convivial of, of ways in the biggest round table that's ever been in this room. Um, I'm always so intrigued, you know, when we, when we join in and you elaborate the complexity and its various contradictions. And I think this evening, the word survey was fascinating for me, but not in terms of the measure of things, but in terms of almost a survey of these terms, this lexicon that we are struggling to find, or not struggling, but in a sense, reveling in. And, and that is a good thing, I think. So the question I have is, how do we find our way in it, through it, with it. We have Anthropocene, but there's also the Capitolocene. There's also the Trutulocene from Donna Haraway, all of which I think bring with them other points of view, to, your, to use one of your phrases, you know, the poly viewpoint, the polyphony of things. And I guess that is what is both unsettling but also intriguing and exciting, I think, for us to try and grasp these, not to measure them, not to contain them in a sort of enlightenment sense of stability, but to actually see what instability might give us as an opening. I think we still, we sort of literally in a transition point here. We, now we know, okay? But we still sort of locked in to ways of knowing that we realize are kind of outdated, surplus to requirements. So it's very intriguing to me, you know, when I hear you both and I see what you reveal and how you reveal it. And I'm working on something called the infrastructure of bracket climate change. There's, there's a detournement in that. I'm not quite sure where it's leading. But, you know, in reading Timothy Morton and his view of the hyper object, his sense of the scalelessness that the Anthropocene and all the other scenes are showing us is that scale is somehow with us and no longer relevant but we're still not quite sure how to work within and beyond in a sense of, in a way of, I think, what's the other word um, that he uses when he describes Margulis's notion of, you know, the, the mitochondria which co-hosts with us. It's a coexistence. It's a, it's a mesh work, you know, that's another term he uses. So again, I don't want to throw more words into the, onto the table. I think there are enough words, wine and, uh, I can and, and bread. But I think all these terms are for us as a constellation of options and possibilities and ah, not to be so fear struck with the headlights because I think there needs to be agency. I'm not quite sure what an agency of coexistence might mean 
on all levels mm. across all scales. So if you have any sort of unrehearsed and un, you know, uh, the just only what thing do that we do? I can imagine, Elena, and I really share this, um, is to invite you back um, on uh, the 11th of November. We are uh, going to host um, Tim Lenton. Tim is uh, a major uh, scientist of the Earth system, and uh, the way through which uh, he and uh, his uh, mentor Watson and the mentor of his mentor James Lovelock would approach this is really fascinating uh, in our minds. It's not about whether the Anthropocene is better than the Stulucene or the plantation scene, and you choose which you pick and choose them. They're very clear. They say, look, we've done maybe 20, 30 years of choosing which part of Gaia you like. Mm -hmm. And each one has a, their own version of Gaia. But the question is now, how do you not recompose them back into one, but accept that Gaia is exactly that uncertainty on how it is received, that it demands so much in order to, you know, Rearticulate a polity that has been gathered by this intrusion of uh, climate. Everybody is troubled by it, but we haven't really understood that we are all troubled by it in different ways. But yet we gather, and I think that is really the interesting thing. Architecturally, it's to me the most fascinating thing. It's not that we are interested in, a, say, planetary turn. No, we are interested in the fact that there is a new possibility of aesthetics, and that is to understand how the presentation of evidence, the presentation of uh, diatribes and uh, inconsistent thoughts is gathering a lot of people with multiple voices, and yet is not institutionalized. And maybe it won't be institutionalized, but. Definitely, that gathering is posing a lot of uh, pressure on its weighing in other institutions. And I don't know anything else than authority does than, except that weigh in. So there's a lot of authority happening at the moment. There's a lot of uh, interesting gatherings, but they're not one. And I think that is, the, to me, the most promising element. I have a word that I would like to add to the discussion, and that is a, I know that some people in the room are working with uh, us, and they will hate me for this. It's a heterarchy. Um, if I may. Um, this is just Anya. kind of a question that I have, but would you say that, uh, so the knowledge, the discussion about brief input that you put about uh, acquiring 100% knowledge kind of intrigued me. So. Would you say that 100% of knowledge is what we would for fa what we would take for fact at present as a means of evaluating the present? By that I mean that the strive for acquiring a greater knowledge in order to transform an inherently unstable system will continually place us in a state of unknown. And the psychological and therefore societal patterns that arise from the unknown, so what one might call a state of chaos. So what I'm trying to say is that effectively, if we take our mark at present and let's say cease to research, but simply reflect, then we've to some degree achieved 100% knowledge. Um, and with that is where I think the institutions form. Um, it's as you both in, in your work, um, uh, advocates for the architects to not simply be designers or curators, but I think more negotiators of various uh, scientific and creative fields. Um, it would almost seem kind of more. It would just it would just make more sense, I think, in some cases, to almost cease research, to kind of halt it right now, and only, to collaborate. Yeah, but only if you think that research is uh, coming before action. 
Well, one Only thing... Only if you are in that state of mind that you think, ah, the more... No, first I need to know, and then I will act. But one, one thing then, that, after. that I found as well very intriguing is that the, the graph that you showed of um, our raising temperatures um, from the IPCC, the, you have the, what I think would be regarded as the volatility area in that kind of spreading out at the very end. And what we are shown um, or what is being discussed more broadly in media is the bottom is the kind of most amicable scenario. It's the 1.5. Why are we not mm. simply just accepting the six? Why are we not simply accepting and discussing the, the six scenario as opposed to operating within the 1.5, which still allows us time to research and to therefore find new information and still constantly be in a state of unknown? The, it's a very intriguing mm, remark, Daniel. There's uh, one aspect in Lovelock's work which is maybe helping us here. When Lovelock says in a clear way, you know, from the outset, uh, from the very publica first publications on Gaia, that it has a goal. That Gaia has a goal, which is very different from what Darwin would say. You know, Darwin is very clear that there's no goal in evolution. There is a goal in Gaia, and that is to maintain inhabitability of Gaia itself. So you can imagine that, yes, six degrees. Mm -hmm. You say, maybe, uh, then we can adapt. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's not clear whether there will be any of us to be in six degrees. Mm -hmm. But yes, Gaia, you could imagine, is doing exactly what it is meant to be doing. And that is, when it's perturbed, it's trying to maintain structures of that allow inhabitation by becoming warmer. Hence, reducing the possibility of livelihood of the perturbant. And that is uh, maybe uh, what's happening, no? By reducing the surfaces and the areas where we can inhabit, no? maybe uh, Gaia is protecting itself, the technosphere, operate, let's remind us of that, through our comfort, which is now contrary to the comfort of inhabitation on the planet. That is a possibility. But just to make clear, not the 1.5 degree target, which we think is actually our major territorial marker, implies another 1.5 when everybody cheered in Paris for the 1.2 degrees, uh, moving towards 1.5, it implies 1.5 billion people having to move because their homes, the current homes, will be submerged by the rising sea levels. So that's 1.5 degrees. And you're talking about 6 degrees as a possible way? I don't follow you there. I think that that is well beyond us. within human life. Um, uh, with the microphone, my, please. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can I ask first? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I've been waiting. Um, I'm quite scared by <coughs> godly views, as you said. Technol complex technology, complex technologies of remote sensing and I've always had that question in my mind. Are we, are we God? You know, the f the, when, you, when, when, when you started this conversation, can we control the planet? It's, it's, it's a philosophical question, and it extends from Carlos's question of the external and the internal. And it scares me. It really, really, really scares me. It scares me when I make a plan, to be honest. We're looking from above. We're looking from a distance. That, it, that is unknown to me, maybe not unknown to scientists, but it's unknown to me. And uh, this is not a question, because you actually answered my question. I'm just posing this sort of remark. 
you answered by saying, and it's honestly, this is one of the best statements of this talk. You answered by saying, you still think God is above. And I think that's really, really important to the conversation that we are having here, to anyone who's thinking that, are we God? Because I was. We, um, I agree with you, and this is just sort of. Yeah. May I point out a, a few things? Because I want to also use the opportunity. Uh, Maybe there was a previous remark about scale. Uh, I think it goes uh, in hand in hand with this. When you draw your plan, or when you look at the map, you do have the view from the zenith. But remote sensing is not that. Remote sensing is not a map. Remote sensing has simultaneously that viewpoint and a view from within. It is technically you call, you can call that a bilocation. You are simultaneously in two places, which is a very complicated thing to discuss. I mean, if you are into a religious thought, you can understand that bilocation has to do with notions of transformation, or in particular transubstantiation, and the condition uh, for one entity to operate across elements. But the the reason why we are insisting so much on remote sensing has nothing to do with the fact that it shows you things at a large scale. On the contrary, it is showing us that the very notion of scales needs to be revised. It's uh, a structure that is n highly networked, you know, where s things that are very large and things that are very small simultaneously operate on the same system. So you have to really abandon the possibility of, let's say, the Russian dolls, you know, one inside the other. And you go from the small scale to the larger to the bigger. And that, I think, is really connected to uh, a notion of the bilocation, uh, of the condition of not really being able to establish ever where you are, which then poses all kinds of other troubling questions. Uh, some of them have to do with the canon and uh, religion and uh, all kinds of other troubling conditions of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is so many different things. It really pertains uh, the structures of the exit from the Holocene, from the entire civilizations that we've uh, built up, which is based on stability. Uh, the entire organization of uh, human language, art, creativity, is from the Holocene. And I don't think that we can use concepts, or better, I think it's very difficult to use concepts developed in the Holocene and apply them straight into the Anthropocene. So we are so, when we say that we, are, we don't know what's going on, we are really troubled. You know, we are really lost. But yes, <laughs> thank you. Well, you comment on that a second. So, I mean, I think, I think that the, the complexity of where we're at is understood and I think probably shared. So, if, it, I mean, I, I think the, the, the way you describe there's a coming together in a sense of people discussing the ideas and that's a positive thing, which I agree Also with. clashing. Yeah, and clashing. But I mean, it's, it's there. It's, it's this sort of coming together of ideas that reveals certain things, not only in terms of the scientific data, but also in terms of our interrelationships with each other and so on. Um, but it seems to me that that leaves us in a, in a difficult place, and I think we all are aware of that, that uh, in, the, in terms of the title of your seminar, you know, plan, so, I mean, that, that pretty much is out the window, you know, the idea of plan in a, mm. in, to, to a certain degree. And then the, the reaction is complex, too, because of the changing context within which the reaction takes place. So do you, do you think that the, this, this coming together, in a sense, of, of our knowledge, information, and agency is a sort of a kind of hybrid between the two? Because if, 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 if it was a feedback system that actually understood the, the dualities of seeing things in different ways, that the fact that they're interconnected, the fact that everything is fluid and everything is changing, uh, then that might work in the sense that, you know, a kind of sort of a, 
uh, a management system, like you, in your heated uh, uh, internal combustion chamber. There is a sort of, you know, a car mm. will have a computer that is trying to balance everything out mm. as it goes along. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually have an answer, it doesn't plan, it doesn't actually sort of totally just react. Mm -hmm. It tries to create a level playing field. Is, is that the sort of thing, uh, I mean, I'm using it as a metaphor, obviously, that the coming together is about? To a certain extent. Uh, to the extent that uh, the new polities, uh, let's call them like this, the new formation of, are not only uh, linked to say, humans. Yes. If we have a, a way of coming together that involves uh, machine, let's say, uh, your control mechanisms uh, and uh, non-human uh, intelligence, and by non-human intelligence I mean not only computer, but I mean plants, I mean uh, the biosphere in relationship to the surface rocks. There's a huge intelligence uh, in the way through which the biosphere is recycling itself. Yes, then that's it. But technically, I think it's also limit, far more limited in our thought. It has to do with uh, the inversion of uh, an aesthetic regime. We tend to think, in particular in architecture in the last 20, 30 years, uh, to the detriment of our uh, knowledge, we tend to think that aesthetic is the way through which you look out, you know, how things look. First of all, things don't look, but uh, you look at things. But, mm. So I think that is a rather interesting inversion of that or an addition to that. Of course, there is an evaluation of what is good and what is bad, which is the first order of aesthetics. The second one is how what are the conditions that allow you to perceive the world. But there's a third one which is really interesting for architecture in uh, the gathering. And that is that there's something happening which brings people together without having to agree, without having to share. And I think this is really the most interesting element of the current uh, ecological crisis, is that many people utterly disagree, but they come together. We haven't yet recognized that we are together in disagreeing, but we are there. Uh, the crust is, uh, uh, is an interesting remark that has happened the other day by the current prime minister. If, if only that video would have were, you know, we would have heard the prime minister telling us that we are facing a major ecological crisis. Which is even more puzzling, no? Because you thought that left and right were clearly established terms, and suddenly you see the arch enemy of the left proclaiming what is now the mantra of the ultra left. So it's a very uh, troubling condition. Uh, but I think that the uh, idea of gathering, yes. Uh, Alia. Um, I wanted to ask why it was titled. Um can we control the planet instead of can we control people? Not to sound authoritarian or, um, but I mean, even the fact that the national, the secular, the religious, all these active agents who seek out mass control are even part of the ecological crisis conversation. It's not like they're actually doing anything to actively, to actively combat it, but it all really does come down to mass control. Yeah, only. I think it um, it's mainly uh, uh, in uh, deference to James Lovelock. There's a particular passage uh, in Gaia where he mentions that, of course, we are never going to be in control of the planet, uh, and he says something like, if it's like thinking that a goat will be a good gardener. Humans will be uh, able to control the planet. Of course not. Yeah. That has to do with our impetus. First of all, we are the only species that controls fire. That's why uh, I think that the co internal combustion engine is really intriguing, yeah, because we've reached now the moment where we know that we have to stop being human. 
We have to give up fire. We cannot burn things. We have to burn them in a completely different way that we use them. But I think that your uh, question is about uh, population and territory. Yes, uh, there's uh, an inherent condition about in a territory around policing, about people. But the whole important element that has been discussed out of that connection, uh, let's say the connection, because this is now a, we are in a seminar mode, uh, comes really from the understanding uh, in Michel Foucault of the relationship between police and territory and population. And uh, the interesting element of that discussion is that it was then labeled biopolitics. And the debate then collapsed there. Biopolitics is immediately distinguished between uh, what is uh, bio and what is zo. Mm -hmm. It's never becoming uh, a condition of thinking a politics of ecology of what eats what, what are the, uh, but it's definitely got to do with humans, not with the rest of life. So that distinction of life uh, remains. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting uh, element that biopolitics is really at the heart of the contemporary discussion. And it excludes clearly, or better, it in makes very clear the distinction between the bios and the zoo, which I find puzzling. I find the entire notion, and I hope to uh, uh, be able to uh, indicate some of the elements, the distinction between people, masses, and ecology is a false one, especially in the Anthropocene. It's impossible to distinguish. But if you're just looking at it as, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, the humans fall on one side of the scale. so in a sense, we do kind of create the distinction, right? And this is the puzzling element of why we put the question like that. My father It's not has about controlling us. Can we con govern ourselves? Of course we can govern ourselves. The question is, we are entered, we've entered in a completely different element. The short-term decisions that we're going to make in the next years mm -hmm. have uh, consequences, not on the long term or medium term, but have consequences of things that happened already. <coughs> That's why it's so puzzling. Because I feel like the discussion doesn't involve human practices enough. Because um, my father has like, this silly little example where he talks about how the Japanese and the Americans culturally imitate a lot. Um, you have the Japanese on one end who will boil tea and then you'll have the Americans on one end who will boil tea to then ice it. And then it's like this cycle and then they'll add milk and they just keep learning from each other and it creates this cycle of, okay, it's creating this distinction between two cultures that learn from each other but then are actively building on kind of taste. But you still can't tell the two people that they're overusing in terms of energy and heat to create something for the sake of It's nothing. a major difficulty, no? I think it's, um, we were discussing it the other day in class, and I'm happy to see you back, but the difficulty is that you cannot tell people to change what they've been doing. No? You cannot seriously go to someone and say, look, all of your livelihood is wrong. First of all, they will treat you as the fool of the village. Uh, why are you to tell us these things? Uh, out of which pulpit are you uh, preaching us? No? So people will not follow you. The second one is that the moment that you try to bring the arguments uh, why you should change your life, no? again, you will fall into the trap of uh, whose argument, whose science, who, me, you, no? and then you, I think you end up exactly in these situations of the coevolution of uh, societies. It's, of, it's obvious that the Pacific in the 20th century was uh, a co-development of Japanese empire and American empire. I mean, you don't need to read many books to understand that. You don't even need to have uh, the cataclysm of the bomb in Hiroshima to understand that. No, you just think in architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright. It's obvious that there's a coevolution, exactly in the same way as the, there's a coevolution between this side of the Eurasian continent and the other side, China. Yeah. The same. <laughs>
So the distinctions of people among themselves are enough. My question, and I think uh, the way that uh, Anne Sophie was articulating what is a world system, is indicating that it's not a distinction between us. You know, everybody who's got blue eyes on one side, everybody who's got one blue and one brown eye on the other side. No, it doesn't work like that. What we're discussing is that it's impossible to distinguish what humans are. And that's the troubling and at the same time beautiful word uh, of the Anthropocene, because we don't know what, who's the Anthropos. Not only we don't know who the, what the planet is, we have no clue who the we is. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't call it, can we control ourselves? Also because we're not Protestants. It's interesting actually that the... Microphone. It's interesting that the... We are on record. The, the comment of number two, long-haired man with a white beard, not the one in the nice sofa, um, he, he, he was pretty upset about the... Um, construction of the coal fire stations. Absolutely. So there is a sort of, um, I mean, we talked about this in the last seminar, actually, mm. that it's a tricky one. The, 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 there's a level of, of recalibrating, re-understanding, which is required to possibly uh, be involved in the process of the future, not necessarily to solve the problem. But I feel very much from that comment that he made that there is also a kind of a, Again, what I said last week, there's a, there's a need for militancy. I mean, there's a level of understanding that the system is evolving in a way that is not going in the right direction, and I think we all accept that. But there's also one of saying, look, you can't be completely stupid and commit the same mistake all over again. So I talked about it, about urbanization the last yeah. time. But I mean, when he says it about the coal power stations, I mean, that's it. You know, once you've built it, it's 50 years of damage in this short yeah. kind of estimation. So it's an interesting one, I think, because I think some of the comments that you were making, I think are probably appropriate in some things. Yeah. It's not people control, but it is actually maybe legislative control or control in another way or, or a body to actually just say, you can't do that. Not, you can't make exactly the same mistake again, in a sense. So that coming together, I think, has to have also a sort of uh, authority to a certain degree. Absolutely. No, in that sense, I, I completely agree. We need to change our lives. I don't know what they are, but um, I mean, you I know, didn't, I didn't catch up on the uh, <laughs> advertisement. It, they're literally just um, metal bottles reus reusable so that people are encouraged to use less Good. plastic. Good. <laughs> I wanted to, to maybe just, um, again, I'm just hung up on words at the moment because I really want to challenge the orthodoxy and the seamlessness with which we are just accepting some of these words without actually slowing down, pausing, and thinking in terms of precautionary kind of principle status of some of these things. So you mentioned biopolitics, you mentioned, Aga, uh, you mentioned Foucault, we Not mentioned. That. I didn't mention. Uh, no, I'm Georgia. going to bench. Uh, but you know, and then we talk about militancy, like absolutely. But you know, when we talk about this emergency we're in, that term, if we remember Agamben and what he had revealed to us, can be used by, you know, the dark forces to completely destabilize a sense of polity or gathering that we want to secure, and I'm playing with words here, but I'm trying to kind of <laughs> regain them so that they're not enclosed. Um, because, you know, the emergency allows states to do all sorts of things with our polity, with our gathering. And so I think we need to be very cognizant about what emergency as a word does if we want to decolonize it or de derail it from complete usurpation by the so-called state and whatever that might mean. So it's just a moment of all of us, I think we talk about plan and we decoding that and I think that's fundamental. But I think we also at some stage within a seminar discussion with different interpretations of these terms need to understand what the emergency, the climate understood as, let's call it Global warming, understood as an emergency, heating does. Global heating. Yeah. 
global heating. Yeah. <laughs> um, technically, you are referring to a particular passage in a little booklet that is beautifully translated into English called State of Exception, uh, authored by an Italian philosopher, Giorgio Gamben. And I think it's chapter four. Uh, a gigantomachy concerning a void, if I recall correctly. I teach this every year, so I should know. Uh, the question is uh, it, that Agamben, as usual, uh, enters uh, etymological discussion. He's very much interested in undoing the common use of parlance in order to uh, reveal in the etym of word conditions of splinter, of uh, disassociation. Is very Benjaminian in that. But he uh, follows a discussion between uh, Walter Benjamin and, uh, at a distance, uh, Carl Schmitt, uh, the theorist uh, of uh, the 20th century uh, nomos. And the question is whether there can be pure violence. And they all disagree. Uh, but in the disagreement, there's sort of a back and forth of writings, they really never talk to each other, but, or they never directly quote each other, but it's obvious in the reconstruction of Agamben that what is at stake is the possibility for, on one side, Benjamin to accept pure violence. And that means violence that is not inscribed into politics. And on the other side, Schmidt says, no, that's absolutely impossible. And in order to achieve that impossibility, he needs to go all the way to the point of saying that the sovereign is he who decides on the exception. And then uh, the exception and the emergency uh, is where the entire discussion is. But there's uh, another element in that, of course, it has to do with the contemporary forms of juridical uh, practices that are not so much interested in decision, but on uh, ongoing and revolving conditions of uh, juridical, uh, say, adjustments. And I think we will have, uh, uh, on the second last uh, session, uh, a lot of this will be discussed. Uh, we've invited uh, two phenomenal uh, juridical scholars. One is a, a professor of international law uh, at the Fritjof Nansen Institute, Davor Vidas, who's rewriting the law of the sea. And uh, another one is, uh, uh, a colleague at the London School of Economics whose uh, uh, work is uh, phenomenal because he's interested in property law and how property, notions of use, uh, are completely uh, to be rethought uh, in contemporary terms. But thank you for alerting us to the difficulties. Sorry for being pedantic and professorial. Uh, it is a seminar. I just wanted to add, like, in all this kind of uh, gloominess and crisis and whatever we have, I, we continuously tell in Deep Four that what an amazing place to be a student today is, because it's about kind of raising the questions of what it is and taking for what we see out there also to be reality and addressing that rather than through many layers of narratives and whatever we have constructed in the last decades, and, and this is really also the, the people we are in, have invited for this series is really people who just look and tell about the situation, and I think that is the f f one and foremost that we have to see and do um, today and gather. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, <laughs> a little bit of... Uh, uh, before we uh, gather and continue drinking and uh, profiting from the conviviality offered by the Architectural Association, I would like to really thank uh, all the students for having initiated this uh, year's uh, uh, rethinking, uh, in particular the group that is coalesced around what you call AA action. And I would like to thank, uh, of course, Manager Verges uh, for uh, organizing the lecture series uh, and the seminar series. It is uh, a continuation, of course, of uh, what we started a few years back on the study of uh, the uh, 
heritage of Jacqueline Turret. And this is uh, uh, work supported by uh, the Graham Foundation in Chicago, to which we are thankful. Next week, we have a session that is going to look at the fact that green is not a color. And we are going to investigate what is the state of nature. It's a session organized by um, Silvita Herr and uh, Matilde Cassani, who are uh, teachers here. And so please uh, join us again on, uh, on Monday. The following uh, week uh, is, uh, I think, uh, open week here. So there will be no uh, seminar, but there is a very interesting uh, event on Monday evening uh, where the curator of uh, the Museum of Modern Art will join us in discussing her work. Uh, she's been uh, recently curating a fantastic uh, exhibition called Broken Nature uh, in um, Milan at the Triennale. So Monday, um, the 28th is uh, uh, Paolo Antonelli. We re will return on uh, the um, Monday, November the 4th, with a session uh, where we gather members of the Anthropocene Working Group. And that is a group of uh, scientists, geologists in particular, that are trying to formalize uh, the current geological epoch. And the title of that is, When Are We? Thank you.